but it's exactly what Sarah said. It's like you do, you can, you get exactly what you listen for, right? Yeah. So if you are, if you are looking for what you don't have in common, that is exactly what you will find. And if you are looking for what you do have in common, that is exactly what you will find. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your mystery meat sandwich. Jack's here. Jack's here. Baby Good. Jack. Yay. Baby Jack. Greetings hey, to Padres <laughs> and greetings to Jack. Yay. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Eternally Amy and another episode of the Boozeless Book Club. Today, I have with me my three lovely lady friends, which actually sounds kind of weird. I didn't mean it in a weird way, but I don't know. We're not, we're not in the trouble. Right. Yeah, no. They're lovely and they're ladies. So I guess it works, but they are entrepreneurs. They are czars of sobriety. Uh, yes, that's right. It's the boozeless babes, not to be confused with the boobless babes. Oh, so definitely in, not. <laughs> in no particular order. Elise Bryson, CEO and founder of The Sober Curator and fellow 80s superfan. And mm -hmm. she's wearing Adidas. Got it? Got it. More mm -hmm. on that later. We also have Sarah Alimo, who is a happiness career coach and a new mom to a three-month-old Jack, who is possibly like the cutest thing ever. And I just... Yeah, he smells really good, by the way. He, so if, if this was like smell a vision, you could totally smell him. Do you remember mm -hmm. that smell a vision? Mm -hmm. That was the weirdest. Okay, <laughs> we also <laughs> have, yeah, we also have um, Carolyn Bunn. She is a marketing expert and a travel blogger. And so guess what? She's traveling. She's not here today. Um, and isn't she down under? She's Amy? down under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good on you, mate. Good on you, Carolyn. We'll catch you next time. Uh, so in summary, you've got Elise and Sarah and Jack, of course, and yours truly today. So what can I say? But, um, oh, and I'm wearing a turtleneck, which is a little constricting. So if you see me kind of like, I just, <laughs> I'm not used to turtlenecks, I guess. I'm kind of like, Ugh. it looks but, really um, nice though. It looks really nice, Amy. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, you can, not everyone can pull off a turtleneck well right? Because of face shape and neck size, but it's working for you. I will take that all day. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move right into the chaplain's chat because we don't need a mystery meat sandwich because we have so much to talk about as per usual, right? So I want to give you guys a little bit of background first before I like um, launch into the blurb. So basically what happened was we were doing the refocusing my family book uh, club last month and, um, you know, September being national recovery month, I knew that I wanted to do something about addiction and recovery. And so I've been trying to, you know, announce the next month's book club book ahead of time. So people can order it if they want to read along, but, uh, that day that I went online, so right before on the line, right before we recorded Refocusing My Family, I wanted to get the title right of the book that I had picked and make sure I had all my ducks in a row. And then I was like reading and I thought, oh my gosh, what's that? Long story long, uh, the book was not actually published yet and it won't be published for like another little, little ways. And so I guess it was a pre-order page or something. So then I had to make like a game time decision. I had to pivot. And again, I want to do something that was recovery focused. So I did a really quick Amazon search and the gangster's guide to sobriety popped up. And who doesn't love the title? Who doesn't love it? 
if you know me well, you know, I'm a huge nineties hip hop fan. And so I assumed falsely assumed this was going to be a book about, you know, being the boss of your sobriety or, um, like taking your sobriety by the balls or something like that. And, uh, yeah, that's not what it was about. So anyways, with that little intro, I would like to read you the blurb super quick. So everybody kind of gets the gist. So Richie Stevens, this is the author. Richie Stevens is an actor who often plays hardened gangsters and criminals. This is easy for him because he was a drug trafficker, kidnapper, drug addict, alcoholic, and all around criminal himself. His twisted life turned and in harrowing self-destructive adventures that took him from his native land of Ireland to San Francisco, Australia, and finally Los Angeles. And mm, I don't know what that word says right there because it looks like it's a big typo. Anyway, the gist of it is he had all these problems moving and so he just kind of kept running to new and more exotic locations because geographicals right so a hard and painful realization eventually hit him that you know there comes a point in which he's about to take his own life and the reason there is a story to tell is because he did not instead he found help and in doing so found himself more than that he found that help comes in different forms, and oftentimes it just takes the right thought to hit at the right time for it all to make sense. The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety chronicles his descent into the abyss of crime and dependency. So his story is sprawling and epic, and the key to the book is the same to his recovery, the 12 steps. So with his own flair and original understanding of life in the world, he followed the 12 steps to find the clarity he needed to save his own life and evolve into a positive force for others. As Richie says, hopefully, if people see that someone as effed up as me could change their life, then there's hope for anyone. So with that ado, I will ask you guys with that ado, without further ado, that's what you say, <laughs> I'll take your ado. Okay, good. Well, I do. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, okay, what surprised you guys about this book, if anything? Well, well I too, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. I too thought it was going to be just how to do the steps like a gangster, like how to be awesome in sobriety. So I was really excited when I started reading it. Um, I love this lovable, hardened criminal. Because I could relate to him a lot. Awesome. I'm, I, uh, I will always buy a book based off the cover. Like right? always, right? So, so I'm just, I love packaging. You put it in a pretty package. I, I don't need more details than that, right? So I took the headline, The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in 12 Steps. I was like, gosh, this is just going to be like the male version of me. It's going to be amazing. And then the black and the yellow, and it had like some guns at the bottom illustrations and with a little coffee cup in the inside. I was just like, super smart, super great. This is totally going to be, I'm going to be really excited about the book this month. Um, Cause I was, I didn't love the book last month. It was okay. It was okay, but I didn't love it. I mean, we set the stage, you know, we started this club and we started with mean baby with, with, Selma Blair. And I was just obsessed with that one. So I kind of thought like, I'm just going to be obsessed with every book this whole next year that we're doing this club. That's not what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I do love showing up and talking with you gals. So I know So I'm still having the best time. I'm just not maybe loving the books in the way that I thought that I would. Yeah. No, I totally get that. I totally get that. And um, yeah, that does actually kind of just blend beautifully into the next question, which is really, do you ladies feel that as a sober woman from the east side of Seattle, hmm. that you could identify with Richie? And if so, how? Or if not, why not? 
Well, I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned coming into recovery is, you know, looking for the similarities rather than the differences. I remember my very first meeting, looking around and seeing just a bunch of salty old men thinking, all right, guess my life's over. Like, these are not my people. But obviously, you know, if I met Richie on the street, I wouldn't think we had a lot in common either, but it just looks a little bit different. I definitely felt a kinship to him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very similar. Uh, you know, you just said, you know, we're East Side Ladies of Seattle, which if you're in any other place in the country, you may not know what that means, but it's a nicer side of the city. Right. And, but when I got sober, uh, my very first time I went to a 12 step meeting was at a uh, North Seattle Alano club and it was, it was gritty, right. It was gritty. Uh, and I walked in wearing a really run down, juicy couture, uh, turquoise, uh, velour sweatsuit. And, uh, admittedly I was missing some rhinestones off my butt. Right. Um, and I looked around, it happens to the best of us. Sometimes we lose a little sparkle. Um, and I looked around and was like, "Uh, uh-uh, nope, these are not my people. Right. And so I walked out and was like, never again, I'm not doing that. And, and it was not very long later that I, I I found myself back in, in, in the, in the rooms, but it's exactly what Sarah said. It's like, you do, you can, you get exactly what you listen for. Right. Yeah. So if you are, if you are looking for what you don't have in common, that is exactly what you will find. And if you are looking for what you do have in common, that is exactly what you will find. So true. You guys, like, that's what I thought too. I thought, um, it just kept reminding me of the principles before personalities, um, phrase that were taught in the 12 step, uh, land world. And you know, I was kind of similar. I, my first couple of meetings, I just thought, I don't even know, no, no, not for me. And, um, I just thought I was better than everybody else to be totally 100% honest. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, those guys, some of them had like legal issues. Some of them had no car no job. They had lost their families. And I literally felt like that was some kind of a moral failure of some kind. P.S. I was in a 12-step meeting, so I wasn't doing great, um, clearly. And it took me a while to really understand what that meant, the whole idea of looking for the similarities and not the differences, and then principles before personalities that one has kind of carried throughout my sobriety thus far, because, um, you know, if you go to a 12 step business meeting, uh, you see some folks, uh, some, um, I'm going to call them, um, you know, jubilant folks, vibrant, very expressive and, um, very into what they believe about what they should do about, different things like the wording of the preamble and the coffee pot um, cleaning situation and all these different things. And it's been really healthy for me to see, wow, okay, all right. Um, I don't agree with this, that, or the other thing, or I think maybe someone's being a little anal or something, but, you know, do I want the program to be around there for the next suffering alcoholic? Absolutely. And so just kind of help change my perspective and, you know, practice that reframing. So um, I don't know. Th- for me personally, um, I did not relate to this book a whole lot, particularly the what it was like part when he was going through the um, discussions about all the different um, adventures he had and nefarious characters that he met. And I I struggled with that. And then um, I kind of struggled with, well, why am I making this about me? I really think there's demographic out there that can totally relate to this. And that makes me really happy. I also kind of felt uh, that this was lacking a little bit of, I'm going to call it 
um, talking about like the feelings, um, the emotions when you get to the very end of yourself, right? When you're drinking, uh, they don't feel good. And I, and I was kind of, I think I kept sort of hungering for, I really was hoping he was going to delve into, you know, how raw that feels and how lonely it feels when, you know, an alcoholic as an alcoholic in his cups, I guess is kind of what I was looking for. And I, I, I could have missed it. Um, I don't know if I found that. What did you guys find as far as the emotions were concerned, as far as any feelings it may have evoked in you? I think with a lot of recovery stories that I read or watch, um, you know, I can just feel that kind of leading up to the final surrender. Um, you know, I could really feel where he was and just, oh my gosh, again, come on, come on. Like just that, that pit in your stomach. Um, I just remember reading that. I read this book right away when we um, first decided on it and I was reading it on my Kindle predominantly around like three in the morning while I was feeding Jack. So it was, it was just kind of a funny, um, you know, juxtaposition there of being in this place with this author and also feeding a baby. Um, it <laughs> brought me right back. I, you know, knowing, um, that the, uh, the screenwriters who co-produced the show, uh, from Silicon Valley, have either of you seen that show? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought that show was hilarious. Brilliant. Right? So I, I thought that I was going to think this was hilarious. Right. I did not. No. Same. And, and, and that's one of the things, quite honestly, I love about sitting in church basements is that we can laugh at some of the terrible things that happened, uh, throughout our drinking careers. Um, and I say career because I really used to say I was a professional drinker. Like I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a professional drinker for the record. Nobody ever paid me to drink. Right. Mm. I mean, I did date a lot of bartenders because obviously free booze. Yeah. It was the perfect, perfect per situation for me. But so, yeah, I went into this book with a lot of expectations mm -hmm. without, uh, that were just purely based off of packaging names, branding, you know, assumptions. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it just, it fell, it fell far below for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, um, it's not a big book. I mean, no, no pun intended. Uh, it's not meaning the page count. It's not a very, it doesn't take very long to read. It's a very, it's a pretty quick read. It's under 200 pages. Um, so it's not like it was a huge time commitment either. So what did you guys think about his community, like going into like his meeting with his, his people? Did you, have you guys ever had experiences like that? How he would find himself in the, the Irish group only? Yeah. I mean, for me, for sure. And that was something that crossed my mind too, is that there are probably a lot of people who can't relate to my story. And I think that for a while I tended to walk into a meeting and sit with, you know, ladies who were dressed like maybe, you know, they had a job or something. I think I had some prejudice when sure. I came in and, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting, you know, and, um, and he had done extensive traveling, you know, and, uh, I definitely tend to look for people that I would assume that I would feel comfortable around kind of an interesting, you know, uh, thing to think about. It is. Um, I don't know why this is coming up for me, but I once went to share my story at a jail and, um, a male jail. I don't, I can't even remember why I was there. Um, but I do remember after sharing my story, uh, a gentleman came up to me and said, wow, I just identified with so many parts of your story. And I was like, hmm. you did? Like, I mean, I'm glad, but you did? Um, yeah, I, I we all carry a level of prejudice with us uh, of, of, you know, people that we think we have things in common with and things that we don't. 
and I don't mean to derail this conversation and talk about prejudice that, that exists in the world. And then the other side of that would be uh, going to a women's only meeting. Quite honestly, uh, I, my share might be a little bit different if I'm in a meeting where we all identify as the same gender mm -hmm. than if I am in a mixed gender meeting. I, I will be I will be different about what I talk about. Agree. I loved the part. I I wanted to um, point out a part that I really loved in the book. It's, oh, good. It, there was one. Oh, good. I know. I I had like two. I'll share. I'll share both of them. But um, okay. I love the part when he because it reminded me of a story, right? So, so I love the part when he was talking about how he made those fake IDs. And he got suddenly so popular because he did such a good job of making these fake IDs and he was selling them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then um, he eventually realized that, you know, he actually could make more money uh, by selling drugs than, you know, he could, <laughs> you know, just sitting around doing drugs and he was trying to monetize everything. And, you know, just the whole concept of wanting more and leveling up. And, you know, so he's like, on these drugs, this, these drugs and drinking alcohol and whatever, but yet at the same time, like following his entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills, or I just cracked me up. And then I was thinking of, um, my mom because as she's, she doesn't really, you know, have anything to do with the drugs and alcohol part, but what she does is every time we pass, if we're in the car, pass like some graffiti on the wall, my mom will go, you know, if if those guys would just do something with their talents, you know, if they would just do something for good, they just they really have some great skills and all this. So what she's trying to do is she's trying to say, you know, say that they have talents, I guess. I love what you brought up, though, about the, the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, because I think that was one of those prejudices that I brought in with a lot of others when I came into the recovery rooms thinking, well, these people like don't have jobs, you know, these people are going to be, you know, you always think of the, the alcoholic homeless guy under the bridge with his bottle in a bag. Well, I have been proven very wrong nowadays. I mean, I think I, I would, I'm in the hiring world. I would hire an alcoholic before anyone else. We are the hardest workers. Look at all that stuff we did back when our lives were so difficult. Um, mm -hmm. There's some crazy, impressive people in recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're hard workers to put up with what we did for as long as we did on purpose. <laughs> well, and even in um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, in the doctor's opinion, it talks about how alcoholics are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. But basically, you know, because it's talking about the allergy, right? But basically all bets are off when we put alcohol into our systems because we're allergic to it. And so that kind of, you know, reminded me of that part when he's talking about, you know, I was trying to figure out how to make more money. And, you know, it just cracks me up that in the midst of our disease, we can still <laughs> be putting forth some decent stuff, you know, and depending on how you're looking at it. but. Did you guys, either of you, learn anything new about addiction or recovery? Because I feel like later in the second half, he kind of, I don't know, when he was talking about going through the steps, he kind of had some, a couple of different takes on things that I thought were interesting. So I didn't know if you guys saw anything that kind of stuck out to you. Uh, not that I no? remember. Okay. Well, not that I remember either. The one that stuck out to me, um, pretty, uh, that I found was pretty, um, I could relate to it, let's say, is when he was talking about his step nine. And so he's talking about going through the amends process. So this is the process where um, you've made a list of all the persons that you've harmed and now you're going to go and make amends to those people through the guidance of a sponsor, basically. And so uh, he is talking to his sponsor because there's these different ways you can make amends, right? There's living amends, um, which is where you just live differently, right? It's like, go forth and don't 
F it up, like stay sober. And then there are indirect amends, which are, you know, maybe like somebody has died or maybe you can't find everybody. And that was his thought is he would never remember or be able to find all of these people, right? The folks of the underworld, right? That he had been associating with. And so, um, so he's talking through with his sponsor, you know, how should I make amends to like my mom? Because some of the amends are like face-to-face -face amends, depending on, you know, how you, how your sponsor thinks that you should do whatever it is. And so the sponsor suggested writing a letter to his mom. And uh, I did most of my amends by writing letters. And um, that's, it's not, it's not a super popular way to do amends. Um, I would say in the 12 step community, this is just my perception from the meetings that I've been around. Uh, that the preferred method in most cases of amends is usually people suggesting that you do face-to-face -face amends. So, you know, and I have like a thousand reasons why I prefer the letter option, but primarily because if I get in front of somebody, I will try and justify, like I just would because my ego gets in the way and so I prefer a letter because I also don't want to just sit down and bombard somebody with something they may want to process, not in my presence. And so um, anyways, uh, I loved that his sponsor suggested writing the letter in that case. And I love also that I personally have found the 12-step program to have a lot of fluidity to the way that these steps can be done. Cause I personally feel like, um, you know, I've seen a lot of different things work for a lot of people. And I feel like that shows the strength of the process, you know, when we can focus on sort of the spirit of the steps and not so much, you know, get involved in the letter of the law type thing and doing yeah, the dogma exactly. around it. Yeah. Dogma, yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. You know, I don't know if we've ever, I don't know if I've had a conversation with either one of you in depth about amends making, because we all met each other later on, like not in our early years, right. Uh, of recovery. And for me, um, I did write letters, but it was only to get very, very clear on what I was supposed to say to make sure I was not causing any additional damage. And, and then I was instructed once I was, I had the letter and I'd gone, made any revisions on it that I needed to after reading it to my sponsor. Um, at that point, I set an appointment to go and I did take the letter with me, but at that point it wasn't more than a page. It was actually, um, she told me to keep my flowery vocabulary to a minimum and not get into details, but talk more broad. Like, you know, instead of saying all the ways that I lied, cheated and steal stole, it was, I didn't go into the, any of the details. It was like, I was dishonest. I was this, I was that, you know, and then going forward, I will be this, I will be that. And uh, did I leave anything out? And, um, uh, and so I did write letters, but then I also, I did a combination. So I did letter writing. And then once I had the green light that, that I had clarity and I had the wording, right. Then I was to go and make my amends in person. And I could read from the letter if I wanted to or not. And I kind of kept it, I kept it as like notes, but didn't, didn't read it exactly, if you will, just so I, I stayed on script. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sarah? How, yeah, how was yours? actually the exact same. And I haven't heard all that many people do it that way. Um, and yeah, it was so that I stayed on track. Um, I did run it past my first sponsor before I met with people. Um, and I really appreciate that because it can be, you know, such a, a scary situation. And I had said, I'm sorry to all those people so many times, but that didn't mean anything to them. So mm -hmm. to come in with my letter and I did end up usually reading them. And then we talked a little bit more because I was so nervous in, in meeting with most of these folks. Um, and, you know, I also kept the letters of the people that I didn't get to meet with. We don't always connect with people again. It doesn't always make sense to see them again, but I at least wrote the letter. Um, yeah. 
I've, in certain cases, I decided not to send the letter. So I don't think I actually sent any, but you know, she would just have me, we, we, I would share with them what I regret. I, um, there were some, and there were some that it was very clearly, I, I wasn't to make amends to, cause I would, there were things that people didn't know at all that I had done to them and it would have caused more damage. Uh, which kind of sucks, right? Because there is that, ooh, if I apologize now, I feel better. Sorry if you feel like shit, but now I feel better, which is not what amends are. That's not it, right? Um, so I have a few of those. I will say, and then I had people that I couldn't find, right? Because I don't know if you know this, but not everyone is on social media. Not everyone wants to be found. <laughs> Whoa, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I... I might still have like my pink razor flip phone in a storage tub somewhere, but I can guarantee it won't pair power on and that I probably wouldn't be able to get numbers off of it. And even if I had, they probably have changed their numbers, but I do have a story I want to tell you about, um, you know, for the ones that I couldn't find, I had to be still willing to do them. Should they magically appear in front of me? And that actually happened one night at the Seattle art museum. Uh, this is, a long time ago so definitely before the pandemic they used to once a quarter they would turn the seattle art museum into a nightclub and um and you could buy a ticket and three the three it was once a quarter so three times out of the year it was inside the museum and then during the summer they would actually do it at the olympic sculpture park i don't know why i'm giving a whole psa about the seattle <laughs> museum right now uh anywho so i this was back in my magazine days and i was going to the party because we were a sponsor and it was a fun party because i love art museums and i love music and i you know i love parties so it was like my perfect kind of world and i'm in there uh with a colleague and right in front of me walks an ex-boyfriend mm -hmm. israel oh israel was so so beautiful uh side note i met him at the summer jams cube 1993 tupac concert and I think this is on theme because we're talking about it's games. totally on theme. And um, and I hope we get to Coolio here in a minute. But uh, yeah. so Israel walks right in front of me and I had searched for him online. I had searched, you know, try I had used one of those like find people services where you can maybe find their phone number or whatever. Could not find him, could not find him. So I could tell my sponsor with a clean conscious, I tried. I could not find him, but the letter is ready to go. Should he ever magically appear? And then there he waltzes right in front of me at this event, right? And he was there because the gal that he was dating at the time was like one of the models that was wearing some crazy costume. You know how they have those like, cool parties, whatever. So he came up and he, and it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we hadn't seen each other in a very long time. And, but it was also not I, it was not the appropriate place to make amends, right? You also don't just like surprise people. So I did say, you know, um, I actually would love to, uh, an opportunity to grab a cup of coffee with you in a week or two, uh, if if you're open to it. Could I, you know, get your number? And he he enthusiastically agreed. I'm sure he thought that meant other things based off of our history together, right? Um, and so when I met him, yeah, a cup of coffee, air mm -hmm. quotes. Uh -huh. And so when I met him a couple of weeks later um, and uh, and reached out to him and explained the nature of why I needed to set this meeting and went over everything with him, um, he was kind of floored. He didn't he didn't really it never the things that I was making amends for had. He I had hurt him, certainly, and I won't go into all the details of what and how and why, but I had definitely it was I had hurt him and in a pretty, pretty, pretty bad way and he and he really appreciated the sincere the sincerity of me owning it after all these years later um but then he went on to tell me uh when i asked if there was anything i had left out or anything more we you know we needed to discuss he was like no i mean i i just this this is such an eye opening conversation and i actually i actually um i just got court ordered to start going to aa cuz i just got my second dui Wow. And maybe could you help, could you help direct me to where do you go to meetings, you know? And so, um, so he, uh, so he started going to my home group and, um, and, uh, you know, he did, he did, we were still flirtatious with each other. Uh, he, he was still a good looking guy. Right. And he still had that charisma, um, that I was always attracted to, but it also, I had done enough work on my own recovery at that point that. I was making better, better decisions when it came 
to men. And um, step him. I did not 13 step him. Yes. <laughs> nice. I know that's, that's your thing, Sarah, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boom, boom, boom. Chang, chang. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, uh, and he, uh, he, I think he went to that meeting for about a year. I know he got at least a year uh, of sobriety. Um, I don't know now what, where he is, what his story is, you know? Um, but for a year he did. And I, I would like to think that that just kind of made that whole relationship come full circle. Right. So you just, I guess I'll wrap this off squirrel story with the fact that when you make amends, you have no idea what it's going to lead to. Mm. And, uh, and I just had to be willing that if he showed up in my life to clean it up, and there are still people that I'm willing that have not shown up. And if, and if in fact they ever do wherever I am, I'll get another opportunity. But, you know, I'd like to think that, um, we both got some healing in that more than I could have ever anticipated out of that amends. If I shared with you guys how my one, like, biggest amends that I needed to make, um, came full circle and, you know, really, um, bonded my relationship with this person based on a podcast. They didn't really fully accept my, um, amends straight off the bat. Cause they did think it was going to be that list. They wanted the list. Mm-hmm. They wanted me to admit to everything I'd done. That's not what this is. <laughs> and then, um, they listened to a Dax Shepard episode where he was talking about the steps with his wife mm. and it clicked and I got a text message. I get it. I accept your amends. Thank you. Wow. Oh, wow. Right. I get goosebumps. Right. Me too. <laughs> also, I love Dax Shepard. I do. I know. I kind of think they're a dream couple. I mean, I'm sure they're not perfect, but I just kind of love them both. I do too. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Frozen fan. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It's Veronica Mars all the way. But um, yeah, that's a great story, Sarah. That's a really great story. Yeah, totally is. And I love to, um, you know, the way that, you know, we become willing, like to do all this crazy stuff, right? And then even bringing it, looping it back a little bit to the book. Um, he was talking about, Richie was talking about when he made his amends to his wife and, you know, he decided that, you know, he's going to say to her basically, or share with her or, you know, basically communicate that he was no longer going to cheat on her. Um, that when he got sober, that was it. He was not going to cheat on her anymore. But my point is like the path gets narrower Like he knew that doing shady stuff, like he knew that was going to affect his peace of mind and, you know, risk his sobriety. And, and it's, it's so true. It's like, we become willing to do some crazy things. And I love that. I think that's such an amazing part of 12 step work is like being willing to do whatever, being willing to be willing even, right? And my husband, P.S., never wanted an amends from me. I asked several times, can I sit down with you? And and these are like, you know, a couple of years apart. It wasn't like I just sat down, you know, over a week and said, hey, is now a good time? And he did not want an amends. And I think that And he's also a repressor. Like he likes to, he would readily admit he stuffed things, stuffs things under the rug that he doesn't want to deal with. Um, But the deal is, is that, um, you know, he just wanted me to live differently. That's what he wanted. My words didn't mean anything anymore at that point. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, everybody's different, I guess. Like, you know, and, and I had an amends that didn't go, very well, but I didn't know that it didn't go well until later. And so, you know, all these different things happen, right? We, we bump up against these people and we just do what we're instructed to do and we do our best and, you know, we leave the results up to God or your higher power because we don't control that part, you know? Yeah. I, I have to tell one more amends story and I, I'm Do sorry it. if it's a repeat for, for either of you, but maybe a listener surely hasn't heard it um, unless they've hung out in the same church basements I have. And that was, I was a 
klepto. So I did, I did really relate to the story in the sense that I stole things. I stole a lot of things, right? And uh, I just like to steal. I like to take things that aren't mine. And I would do it with the, um, this is how I would reason it. I would be like, well, if it's an item on the bottom of my shopping cart and the, the store checkout clerk doesn't see that it's on the bottom of my cart and doesn't ask me to put it up and ring it in, that's their job for not, that's their fault for not doing their job. Therefore, it's okay that I take it out of the store without paying for it. What the <laughs> hell? Right. Um, and so I had to make a lot of financial mins to Michael's, Joanne's Fabrics, Target, Macy's, like a lot of financial amends. Uh, but the very first one, you never forget your first of anything, I think. And so the very <laughs> first financial amends I went to make was at Michael's. And I, I had gone over the instructions with my sponsor. I was very clear. I had figured out what I thought I had, you know, the dollar figure was about $75, which is pretty low actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, I walked up to, you know, a, a woman wearing the little Mike Michael's apron. And I was like, my name is Elise. And, you know, I'm a member of this program. And, um, a couple of years ago, I, I took some things from a Michael's without paying for them. And I, I would just, I would like to rectify that and, and make it right. I'd like to pay it back. And she just looked at me, didn't blink, didn't blink. She was like, okay, I'll see it. Cash register three. Wow. And I was like, and I didn't, I, this was my first experience. So after that, I didn't know that most people are like, you want to do what? Right. You know, most people don't know what to do with you. They're like, I don't even know how to deal with that. Right. Yeah. Um, but she was like, yeah, I'll see it. Cash register three. And I was just like, oh, wow. I guess a lot of people steal from Michaels. And, um, <laughs> and we got up there and she was like, what did you take? And I was like, this is what I took. And it was from this department. And she was like, how much was it? I was like, I think around $75, you know? Um, and I know exactly what I took because at the time it was actually still hanging on the wall in my living room. Mm. It was a, it was a floral print, like Fleur de Lis image illustration, beautiful with a black frame. Mm. And, um, and so she rung me up and I gave her my cash and she handed me a receipt and I lost it. I just, bleh, you know, just started just sobbing. Oh, and she just was like, have a nice day you know? And I went home and I taped the receipt on the back of the picture. Um, oh. And I have to tell you what I recognized after that moment was up until that moment, every time I looked at that picture, which was every day, cause it was in my living room. Subconsciously, I knew that's not mine. I didn't pay for that. But mm. now I knew I paid for that. I, Ugh paid for that. Right. And I don't have it anymore. I actually sold it in a garage sale. Uh, but, but it was yours I, to sell. It was my, it was mine to sell. It was mine to sell. And, um, and, and I don't steal from Michael's anymore. Right. And that's the power of making amends in a proper way. It's not just, it's not about apologizing that, Oh, I did all this bad stuff. Ooh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, it's, I'm not going to have that behavior anymore. And I tell you what, you make enough amends to places like Michael's and Target and Macy's. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating, you know, to walk in and be like, I did this. Uh, and but what but by doing that over and over again, now I got to tell you, temptation to steal still there. Just like sometimes the idea of a drink still seems like a good one. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to act on it anymore because I know if I do, then I have to go and pay it back. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do that anymore. Right. I really don't want that. Right. And because yeah. it was never about the money. I mean, yes, there were times I was dirt poor and had no money and needed to steal. I understand that. But most of the time when I stole, it was just for just for the thrill of stealing, not because I couldn't pay for whatever I was stealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've often explained amends to people as I want to be able and this. I feel like this doesn't even work anymore now post pandemic. Um, I want to be able to turn a corner at the grocery store. And if I see someone on that aisle, I don't want to feel embarrassed. I want to be able to have a, you know, look them in the eye, but I don't go to the grocery store anymore. So that example doesn't work. I need to come but up hypothetically. With if I saw someone on zoom, I want to be able to talk to them. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those were such good stories. You guys like powerful, seriously. And here's the thing too, is it's like, 
you know, I get that it's the last day of September, but this is the September book club. And September not only is, you know, the National Recovery Month, it's also the ninth step is what a lot mm. of the meetings um, base their topics off of during September, yeah. so ninth month, ninth step. And so it all kind of blends together. And I feel like the universe just works that way. And um, I loved hearing all of this and it all relates. And on that note, I have to take a left turn um, out of nowhere and talk about Coolio because oh, I gangsters kind of paradise. Yeah, yeah, we do. Too. When I heard that news, I was like, thank God I'm talking to them in a couple of days. Thank God. So it's cardiac arrest is the last information that I have of of, of the cause of death. Okay. And I know for a fact that two of the three of us Mm -hmm. have had a heart condition on this call. Yeah. Um, And I, uh, I, I know in my case that although my, um, my emergency heart surgery happened in recovery, I was right around 10 years sober. I have zero doubts that my alcohol and drug abuse for the, for my drinking career from the age of 16 to 30, I know it played a part in, Mm. in, in, in my heart issues. So I have not, I don't know Coolio's story, obviously, but man, did I love him as an artist in the Mm nineties, right? Just that, I mean, I have lots of time thumping to my boom box uh, mm-hmm. to Gangster's Paradise. A lot of time. I thought that made me gangster by knowing all the words to that. A hundred percent. It little, does. You know, Orange County town that I grew up in, that gave me some street <laughs> So Of course it does. Well, um, I was, I sent at least this text on, I guess it was the day or whatever. And it was like a picture. It was a screenshot of a tweet. And I was just like, Oh, the fantastic voyage is over because that is my favorite Coolio song. And Mm -hmm. to this day, any time that comes on, it's like, it's as if someone is, I don't know, playing YMCA at a wedding. And it's like a wedding full of people, our age and North. And like the whole tone of the room changes and all of a sudden just everybody's dancing. That's how it is for me in Fantastic Voyage. So, well, um, there are certain songs like that, right? That that whether it's, you know, crisscross, jump, or it's Naughty by Nature, OPP, there are certain songs that it just, when they come on, like it, people, it just brings people together. I do think, um, the new Macklemore's newest song, Maniac. I mm-hmm. gotta say, didn't love it the first time I heard it. By the second time I heard it, I was like, I I, I like the beat. Third time I heard it, I was like, kind of growing on me. Watch the music video. Now it's like on repeat. I love it. And I feel like that's gonna be a song for me in the future that will bring me up out of my chair. But you're right, Coolio, um, great, great contributor to the 90s music scene, without a doubt. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And on the the cardiac arrest note, I must say, you know, my whole, uh, not cardiac arrest. I don't know why I said arrest. Maybe I was thinking about, yeah, (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Gangsters and the life of crime and all of that was presenting itself, but cardiac issues. Okay. Um, I was thinking about my own story and how I actually struggled with my ego during that whole time because I was afraid because this was like in 2018, 2019 for me. Um, and I was afraid people were going to think I had relapsed. And that's why I was having mm. heart issues. And mm. it was very important to me to let people know that like I was still sober. I was mm. like all about making that a thing. And that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I know. From We see that as a cause of death a lot of times when it could be, you know, it is our alcoholism. I have a family member who 100% is an alcoholic and that's what the cause of death is listed as. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, I think that you're right. It's totally common. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, I just wanted to be sure that everybody knew it had nothing. It was a virus. It was a virus. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I don't know. There's your pride and ego, like room for growth, I guess, is my point for me. 
for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, going back to one more thing about the ninth step, um, I actually just took a sponsee through this the other day. And, um, you know, if, if you're familiar with 12 step language and lingo and the things we talk about, then you're probably familiar with the promises, right? Uh, but people often forget the promises are part of the ninth step and the, we will be amazed before we are, we are halfway through. Yeah. That is halfway through of the making of the amends process. That is exactly what that section of the book is talking about. Mm. And so when I take women through the book, that is what I explain to them. Like you got your list. Okay. Tally it up. What's 50%. Boom. Get to that right? Get to that. You don't have to do it all. And I don't care which order you want to do the easiest, what you think are the easiest ones Mm -hmm. go for it. Right. In my experience, the ones I thought were going to be the easiest ended up being the hardest. And the ones that I thought that were going to be the hardest ended up being the easiest. That was my experience. It's different for everybody. Um, but a lot of people have so much fear around amends and that's why it almost keeps them from ever wanting to work any kind of a, a program. Uh, but there's so much healing and freedom that comes from it. There's a reason those promises are there in that section, in that step for a very specific reason. Right. And I love that you said that your hardest ones turned out to be your easiest ones and your easiest ones turned out to be your hardest ones or the ones that you perceived would have been. And, you know, I, I think that that just all falls right in line too with the fact that we all started this call saying how we didn't really love the book. And yet here we've had this beautiful discussion unfold. And I just know one thing that I've learned over my years of being sober is that I have no idea what's good for me. And it seems like the more I know, the less I know. And yeah, and it's just so fascinating. So I, I so love and appreciate you guys. I mean, this is just such a, an amazing, um, very fulfilling conversation for me. So thank you so much, despite not loving the book. So, well, but the thing is, you know, what I will say is we don't have to love the book for this book to make an impact on somebody else's life. Right. hundred percent. There are people that I am absolutely confident this book will speak to. Right. Um, even if it isn't, wasn't the three of us and it's still a great cover. It's still Mm -hmm. a great title. It'll still go in my little sober library that I've been working on building. Right. People come over to my house and they're like, wow, you have quite the sober library going on. It's like, yeah, because you know what? When I got sober, like they were like, besides the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there were like a couple other books and none of them spoke to me. But over the 16 plus years I've been doing this one day at a time, every, you both have books, right? There are so many books out there. And what I love about that is it's the storytelling and storytelling allows us to connect. And when we connect, that is the opposite of addiction. That's right. Exactly. Absolutely. See the, the book combination of two alcoholics moving it and marrying each other. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I can only imagine what happens and in your house, Sarah. He 18, so his collection is impressive. <laughs> I bet. So what did Jack think about the book? Um, oh, he is awake. <laughs> yeah. Was it a snoozer? Was it a snoozer for him? <laughs> well, considering that he was sleeping for the whole time I was reading it. Um, yeah. you know, I've already started having conversations with him about, you know, I know someday you will have alcohol, but just so you know, it's not good for mom and dad. It might not be good for you, but we're here for yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. There you go. He's going to know where to go. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, thank you, boozeless babes. I mean, you guys are babelicious. This has been wonderful for me. And for the bailout bag, I would love to talk about next month's book. So next month, October is National ADHD Month. Um, And basically what that means for me is, of course, I'm like, shoot, let's learn more about ADHD. So we're going to read a book called Your Brain's Not Broken, colon, Strategies for Navigating Your Emotions and Life with ADHD, okay? So in Your Brain's Not Broken, that's what I'll just call it for short, Dr. Tamara Reuser explains how ADHD affects every aspect of your life. Yes, you'll finally understand why you think, feel, and act the way you do. 
So she applies her years of coaching and offers practical tools. We love practical tools. So here's the thing, whether you have ADHD or not, right? I mean, you probably have somebody in your life who has it, who maybe annoys you. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there, whatever. Um, so that will be a really interesting, really interesting discussion too. And I'm looking forward to reading that with you guys. So yeah. on that note, Remember to be kind, rewind, thank you for the honor of your time and take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.